deliver a message from God's word. We find in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, that the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Now, if you were to ask anyone on the street what they thought a Christian was, can you imagine what kind of an answer you'd get? I'm sure we would get a variety of responses. Many today hold the view that a Christian is really anybody that just accepts Jesus as a personal Savior. And that name, that title, has very little, if not nothing, to do with one's knowledge of the Bible. As long as one lives a what they would call a good moral life, they would be considered a Christian. They would fall into this category. However, if you were to apply that line of logic, even some atheists would be considered Christians because some of them do also live a, quote, good moral life. Certainly, we don't believe that, but even those who would completely denounce God's existence, who have devoted their lives to hating a being that they claim does not exist, how would they, too, be considered a Christian? Obviously, that makes no sense. Of course, it doesn't make sense to be an atheist either, but follow me here. Now, while it is the case that living a biblically upright life is expected, demanded by the gospel, it is also true that unless one becomes a Christian, their good deeds amount to nothing. Such a conclusion can and must be drawn from Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Those people mentioned there no doubt did good deeds but they were not qualified to perform them, thus they heard the answer, I never knew you. One must hear, believe, repent, publicly confess Christ, and be baptized for the remission of sins in order to become a Christian. Complying with these terms of pardon allows that individual to receive forgiveness by the blood of Christ. At that point, they are saved, they are a Christian, they are one that is of Christ. They become a disciple of Christ and one who would strictly adhere to his teachings. Now that's typically what we refer to as the definition of a Christian. But what does it mean to be a Christian? Well, that goes beyond just a, a small definition of terms. Although that would be necessary. Now, some of these elements were discussed yesterday as part of the lectureship, and they were done very well, went into great detail. Today, I would like to go over some of them by way of summary. But I would like for us to consider then what it means to be a Christian. First, it means being converted. Converted. When a person becomes a Christian, it means that they have made a giant change or transformation. This individual is no longer a servant of sin. They have put to death the old man of sin, all those old sinful behaviors. Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 14. Instead, they are those who fall into the category, as Paul mentions in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. He says there, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The idea of being transformed is similar to the process by which a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. Metamorphosis. Now, as a child, I thoroughly enjoyed Transformers. That show came on when I was a kid. 
Now, I still like Transformers, but my son likes them more. And he's able to transform these robots in disguise by himself. But they appear to be one thing, say, a truck, and they transform into something different. Now, as the toys are concerned, you can switch them back and forth, you can transform them, but the Christian should be very similar to that. We were in one state or one condition, and through that conversion process, we transitioned to a different state spiritually. We are transformed. It is expected of us. When we become a Christian, we should not be the same as the individual we once was or once were. That is how drastic of a change that each and every individual must make in order to be converted and be a Christian. Because of this change, there are many things that one must stop doing. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 21 through 25 reads, If so be that ye have heard him, and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor, or speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Part of being converted means that we must change our desires. This is seen in the passage that we just read. Now, because the Christian no longer engages in such activities, such behaviors, these old lusts, many think it strange, and they might persecute us accordingly. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. Now, I would point out that the Christian is not different for the sake of being different. It goes with the job. It's not our life's goal to pick out a group of people and just be different from them because we feel like it. By following God, we become different from the world, and people will take note of that because we've been converted. Secondly, it means being humble. It means being humble. When one is humble, they are in full submission to God. And they lack the pride that others might possess, and even they themselves might have once possessed. In Psalm 10, verses 2 through 7, we see that humility, or the lack of humility and pride, is a trait of the wicked. Psalm 10, verses 2 through 7. It says, The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous, whom the Lord abhorreth. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. He hath said in his heart, I will not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. None of these traits are pleasing to God. In fact, he says they're abhorring. They're abhorreth to him. God hates them. Thus, they ought not be named among any of his children. Instead, we should strive to possess the very attitude of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We see in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, that he was described as having or being lowly in heart. He was humble. We were told in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, to possess his mind. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. 
Jesus, our Savior, had a purpose in coming to earth. He knew it before he ever left heaven. In spite of the pain, agony, the betrayal, and even the loss of the glory he once had in heaven, he obeyed the Father. And thus we're expected to obey him, to submit to God. James chapter 4, verse 7. If we want to be great, we must be willing to serve. Matthew chapter 10, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 20, verse 26, and Mark chapter 10, verse 43. We must be humble. Third, it means being reverent. Reverent. One must possess the proper fear and respect for our Creator. It is said of God that His name is sacred and demanding of respect. Psalm 111, verses 9 and 10. It says, He sent redemption unto His people. He hath commanded His, co his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. The proper respect for God is the beginning of wisdom. Jesus taught his disciples how to address the Father in prayer. Even moments ago when we prayed, Hallowed be thy name. That was the term used. Luke chapter 11, verse 2, and Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. The model is, after this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. God is to be considered holy, sacred, and pure, for he is all of those things. And thus we are expected to communicate with him accordingly, to show that respect for him as we communicate with him. And prayer is how we do that. He deserves this respect because his word carries authority. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape? If we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with the signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. The comparison here is made between the word of angels and the words given by God directly. The words of the angels were steadfast. They were true. They carried weight. They were powerful. But how much more so is the word of God compared to them? How much more weight, power, and authority do they possess? This is specifically noticed in the New Testament gospel system. Thus the Father expects, demands, and deserves our reverence, especially as his children. We as parents often expect our children to respect us. We need to respect our Father, our Holy Father, our Heavenly Father. Fourth, it means being innocent. This is when one lives a blameless life that is above moral reproach. We are expected to be, expected to be blameless in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. It says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found in, of him in peace, without spot, and blameless. As Christians, we are to perform the will of God. Philippians chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Part of being blameless 
is avoiding the sins listed in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Now, later in that chapter, that would include bearing the fruit of the Spirit, uh, verses 22 through 24. So we must abstain from the works of the flesh while still producing the fruit of the Spirit. You cannot do one without the other and still be expected to be faithful to God. We must note that being blameless is not necessarily the absence of sin or living as a completely perfect and sinless individual. Because that would mean that the Christian could never commit a sin. Well, we know that's not the case. It indicates, rather, that one has the reputation of following after God, obeying His commandments. It indicates that one is upright and willing to make the corrections necessary to remain as a child of God when they do commit sin. This is seen in 1 John chapter 1, verses 5-7. through 7. And even verse 9 and 10. You can see this in the, in the small example of an honest man. When an honest man lies, he has two options. He can repent, admit his error, and by doing so he remains honest. Or, he can persist in that lie, and at that point he gives up his honesty. Thus, the innocent person has the reputation of being righteous, but also being quick to repent and make any type of restoration in order to maintain and remain righteous. Fifth, it means being sanctified. One is dedicated to Christ and thereby set apart for his use. Were special. Under the Old Testament law system, Israel was told repeatedly that they were to be separate from the rest of the world. Leviticus chapter 20 verse 7 says, Sanctify yourselves therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. Well, New Testament Israel has a similar expectation. We are expected to be just as separate from the rest of the world. Romans chapter 12 verse 1 as we've already read. As well as 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 11. And 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 13 through 16. There it says, Wherefore gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the, rev the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. All manner of conversation leaves nothing out. The child of God will be holy and sanctified in every aspect of their life. Those who have obeyed the gospel and been added to the family of God are no longer children of the world. Instead, they are now children of God. One cannot be a child of both God and the world. This is an impossibility. There is a logical distinction then and separation between the two. We find this idea in James chapter 4, verse 4. There's enmity between the two. Great hatred. The Christian must be sanctified or separate from the world in order to serve God as a priest. For all Christians are indeed priests. Instead of offering those dead animal sacrifices, we offer spiritual sacrifices today. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. Fifth, or excuse me, sixth, it means being thankful. One needs to be grateful to God, to Christ, and their brethren. The psalmist penned in Psalm 100, all five verses, says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, 
and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. You see, we have so many things to be thankful for. Just from this small passage, we see that God created us. As his people, he guards us as if we're his sheep. He is our shepherd. He protects us. He cares for all of our needs. He is good and full of mercy. And his truth endures. It does not change, and nor does he. We are expected then to offer thanks continually. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 20. Colossians chapter 3 verses 15 and 17. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 18. In fact, being unthankful is a sign of one's unfaithfulness. Romans chapter 1 verse 21 says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. When the Gentiles eventually gave up on God, part of the reasoning that that had happened was they were not thankful to him as their creator. We have many things to be thankful for. Do we ever try, as the song says, to count our many blessings? All too often we get accustomed to the comforts that we do enjoy, and we fail to appreciate these liberties and luxuries. Something as simple and normal to us as having a building to gather in, the air conditioning that we enjoy, especially in Texas. It's hot here sometimes, most of the time. Without that air conditioning, I think a lot of us would be in a world of hurt. Even the heater. Are we thankful for the heater? Small things like those things. Really, those are luxuries. Are we thankful for them? Are we thankful for the life that God gave us? Are we thankful for, for his son, his willingness to come to the earth? Now, oftentimes we do hear that in our public prayers. We are grateful for many things. But individually... Are we actually grateful for what God has done for us? Seventh, it means being influential. One must be a good and useful influence on those of the world. We are to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all them that are in the house." Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Salt adds flavor and it also preserves. Thus we are expected to preserve the world, those who are in it, both heathen and godly alike. And we do that by our godly influence. There's a song that we sometimes sing. It's Make Me a Channel of Blessing. Simply by being a Christian in the environment that we're in, say on the workplace, our boss has a great benefit simply by us being employed there. Our work ethic should be superior to that of those around us. As Christians, we're not going to be stealing inventory. We're not going to be lying. We're not going to be causing issues with customers. We're not brawlers. When something is told to us, hey, I need you to do this, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, we'll get that done. It's a godly attitude. And unfortunately, it's becoming more and more rare in the world around us. But our influence can cause others to copy us, 
to copy our efforts. While they might not become Christians, they do start acting differently. When you start telling folks, say, I don't use foul language, and they stop, which can be done, they'll be around you and they won't be using that foul language. And eventually it starts becoming a habit, and they too stop using that language by large. It's a ripple effect. We should never underestimate these small acts of obedience to God and the good effect that they'll have on those around us, especially generations to come. The very lectureship we had yesterday is being published on the Internet, probably already is. How many people are going to be hearing those lessons in the future? Think of how much good it did for us yesterday, for those who were here, and then how much more good it's going to do for those who hear it later on. We find in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 12 through 13, that the young preacher Timothy was instructed and told to let no man despise his youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity, till I come give attendance to the reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. Now obviously... Timothy was expected to be a good example to those of the world. And being an example of the believers is while we do interact with those of the world, we should be the good example representing the church and ultimately Jesus. But I think this verse lends more. We need to be the good examples amongst the brethren. We need to be more like that team captain on, a, say, a football team where we inspire greatness to our brothers and sisters around us. We are that shining example of what they could be. And it's not saying that we're any better than them. But be the good example that they might even need to see. As we grow and develop as Christians, we're going to learn more things that new Christians do not know. And they're looking to us to see how we behave in certain circumstances. They're looking to us to see what we say in certain circumstances. We need to be that good example of the believer. We are influencers for good when we teach God's word. But more importantly, when we live God's word, when our actions align with our teaching, when our actions, the words we use, and what we do align with God's word. It was pointed out yesterday that people are very easily to spot a hypocrite. Don't be the hypocrite that they have the reason for not being in worship. That's a poor reason anyway. But don't give them any ammunition. Be the good influence. Our Lord showed his apostles a good influence when he washed their feet. John chapter 13, verses 12 through 17. He gave them an example to follow. We find here that the master is serving the servants. And if we are indeed going to be influential, we need to be serving others. That's not always a very pleasant thing to do, but people take note of it. And he expected them to follow their example, and he expects us today to follow such an example. Eighth, it means that we're active. We're active. We're busy serving God. After finding the younger Jesus, what did Christ say to Mary and Joseph? In Luke chapter 2, verse 49, says he said he was busy about his father's business. Was he exercising carpentry at that time? No, he was doing what his heavenly father had sent him to do in teaching and learning. Are we busy about our father's business? We're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, to be working. Therefore, my brethren, or my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We're expected to be working and laboring. It is to be a constant effort and not haphazard. 
By laboring for the Lord, we eventually will be able to reap eternal life. Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, or 6 through 10, rather. We must not grow weary in well-doing, and there is no greater labor than saving souls. We must ensure that we ourselves are saved and maintain that, that status before God, but at that point we're properly qualified to teach others, to save others through the gospel. Now, active does not always mean that you're, you're expected to go on foreign fields and have a missionary trip, although that would definitely be a characteristic of being active. It could be something as simple as hanging a sign at work. I remember when I was working at Sam Houston, Lavelle Henry, he was the uh, manager for the custodial department, and he had this sign on his desk. It says, best to my remembrance, Foul language is a sign of your ignorance. Please do not use it in this office. And where he had it, whenever you came into his office, you would see that sign. You think anybody ever read it? I did. I read it several times. But folks who don't necessarily know any better, they see that sign and it might have them pose a question. Well, what do you mean by foul language? What do you mean I'm ignorant? You just spark some thoughts. You just open a doorway. Either way, it'll have them set up and take note. I used to have the, a sign above my desk. It listed the plan of salvation. And there were several folks that I saw their eyes looking up at it, and they read it, and I was waiting on them to ask their question because it was work-related. Most of them didn't, but some of them asked religious questions. It opened doorways. It's those little things that still active, but they're useful. They might be small, but they're useful. We're not going to convert the world all at once. It's going to take one soul at a time, incrementally. But we've got to start. What about tasks around a church building? We have the Lord's Supper table prepared. Somebody had to prepare the bread, to prepare that grape juice for our partaking of the Lord's Supper. That's a task that somebody had to sign up for. Does anybody ever think of that? Eh, it's just a menial task. It's a form of worship. Something as simple as taking care of our songbooks. Instead of ripping out pages or ripping out the ribbons to, to keep a place. These are great blessings that we have. And if nobody does them, we cannot worship God properly. Somebody's got to do the work. Lectureships, like, like the one we had yesterday. Where were you? Now that we have the Zoom meetings every Wednesday night, where are you? How do you miss an online meeting? It's one of the more convenient things that we do. We all have a smartphone, whether it's an Apple or Android or some other combination of gadgets. You get the same email I do. Do we make an effort to be remotely involved with the worshiping of the saints, even if it is via Zoom? We cannot be ready to be active if we are absent. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these things, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet, or suitable, for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. That does, that does not happen miraculously. It does not happen magically. It does not happen overnight. It takes work. It takes dedication to God. And it takes practice. You might not be doing a good job at it in the beginning. It doesn't mean you have to stop. I remember whenever I was first giving my first speech in high school, I never looked up. I had my note cards, and I was talking about a subject that I thoroughly enjoyed, which was Oriental Dragons, but I never looked up. 
I, I reckon my knees were probably knocking. I was embarrassed. This was the first time that I'd ever actually spoken in front of a crowd, and it was classmates. I was a freshman. There were seniors in that class. I didn't know any of them, so I wasn't necessarily embarrassed of making a bad impression with them, but when everybody's staring at you trying to give your report, it gets a little weird. It gets a little anxious. Now, I'm by no means that great of a speaker, but I think of how long I've come in those 10, 15 years. But I had to start. I had to start. And number nine, it means being new. The Christian is a new creation. He or she is a different person. This idea is seen in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. We're a new creature. Old things are passed away. When one puts to death the old way of living, the old life of sinful behavior and is baptized, they rise from the water a new person. They are reconciled or brought back to God, their creator. Undergoing this new birth is how one is reconciled. John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. The expectation then is to live a new life, a godly life. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Part of that new life is yielding to the will of God. We had a sermon relatively recently about the potter's clay. We need to be that clay, willing to have our Creator shape us for His needs. So doing, we become the instruments of God. Romans chapter 6, verses 11 through 13. A prime example of this newness, I would say, is seen in what we refer to as the prodigal son. In Luke chapter 15, verses 17 through 19, it there says, Of this son, and when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. This boy lived in rebellion against God and his father, and when he left, he gave his life over to riotous living. But we see when he came to his senses, he understood that he had sinned, and he had fallen short, and no longer worthy to be considered his father's son. But he took action. He took action in restoring that relationship. Now each of these elements are necessary in order to be faithful to God. This was not meant necessary to be a full in-depth study of each of these elements. But oftentimes we consider the definition of a Christian and we stop there. Sometimes we might fail to realize it, it, it's more than just defining of terms. And we don't need to excel in just one of these elements, but all of them. We must possess all of these qualities and grow in each one. Now, some of these elements might be easier to exercise for some. They're still necessary for all. And we cannot be accepted, or expected to excel in one and not the others. Nor can we expect a newborn Christian to be excelling in really any of them. But we've got to be the brethren that these new Christians need. We've got to be the brethren that God expects us to be. We cannot be the brethren that God expects of us until we are a Christian. We've already talked about what is necessary to become a Christian. So if you would like to do that this morning, become a Christian, a new convert, why not take the necessary steps this morning? Now, as a child of God, if you've allowed sin back into your life and you're lacking in one of these elements or any other area in your life, be restored to your Creator. Repentance, prayer, confession will restore you to a proper working relationship with your Creator. If either of these apply to you, please make it known as now we together stand and sing.